Good evening. The horse and his boy, 60 years on. <coughs> Here is an early edition of the book showing you the original cover art by Pauline Baines, who, as you know, did the illustrations for all the books. I've chosen to concentrate tonight on the horse and his boy for two main reasons. First, because, as the title shows, this year marks the 60th anniversary of its publication. The Horse and His Boy first came before the public in 1954. So this year is its diamond jubilee. That's reason enough. Always peg things to anniversaries. And the second reason I've chosen is because this is probably the least well-known of the Narnia books. And probably also the least well-liked. I remember when I was a boy thinking not very much of this story. When I was a kid, I wanted the Pevensey children, and the Pevenseys hardly appear in this story. I also wanted Narnia, and most of this book is set in the southern kingdom of Calamon, in the desert, and in the neighbouring kingdom of Archenland. Hardly at all anything happens in Narnia. So I was a bit disappointed by the <coughs> horse and his boy, and I think this attitude is rather common. It does seem a bit of an outlier when set along the other, alongside the other six tales. But actually, it's a very good book. When I was a child, I thought as a child, when I became a man, I put away childish things, and I now, <laughs> I now regard this as a fine piece of literature. It deserves to be much better known, and it will repay our close attention over the next, uh, will you allow me to speak for up to an hour? And then we can have some questions and answer and discussion up until, I don't know, nine o'clock maximum. Good. It's interesting to compare The Horse and His Boy with some of the other Narnia chronicles, I think. The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, for instance, is very obviously connected, imaginatively speaking, to the Gospel account. Aslan dies and comes back to life, redeeming the traitor Edmund. Magician's Nephew. That's the Narnian equivalent of the creation story in the book of Genesis. The last battle, that is the Narnian apocalypse. What's the horse and his boy about, biblically speaking? What was that sign I saw as we drove into Biola tonight? Think biblically about everything? Something like that? Yes. Well, think biblically about the horse and his boy. How does it connect to the Bible? Well, I want to say that the Horse and His Boy is about this. That's right, silence. <laughs> and by silence, I don't mean merely wordlessness. I don't mean an absence of words. I mean so many words that only silence can communicate them. Silent witness. <coughs> Pregnant silence. How can silence bear witness? Well, we know that in many circumstances, words fail us. And the best thing we can do is simply to be present with our interlocutor at a funeral, say, of someone close to you. You don't necessarily want people showering you with words. You just want their presence. You want their company. You want their hugs. You want their tears. Those ways of communicating are without words, and yet a great deal is being said. Or think of it at the other end of the emotional spectrum. Not great grief, but great joy, great love. Shakespeare says in Much Ado About Nothing that silence is the perfectest herald of joy. So many great poems and songs about love repeat this point that we are often dumbstruck by the presence of the beloved. Their beauty cannot be adequately praised in words. Our love for them cannot be adequately expressed in words. Kisses, caresses, just sharing the same space as the other person is the best language, not a pile of verbiage. There is indeed a popular song which has it, you say it best when you say nothing at all. <laughs> so both in the depths of emotions and in the heights, we often resort to expressing ourselves through actions, not words. And indeed, we often say actions speak louder than words. We don't want a lot of talk in those situations. We want to walk the talk. Silence is golden. 
It's not merely absence of words. It's rather words to the maximum. Words, as it were, flooding our features, flooding our bodies, flooding our gestures. We become mime artists, saying all we need to without verbalising any part of our script. Well, let's think for a moment about silent witness from a biblical point of view. The psalmist tells us how silence can be very communicative. Think of Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. The opening verses of Psalm 19. And Paul quotes Psalm 19 in his letter to the Romans, chapter 10, you remember, where he writes, How are men to call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? Faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes by the preaching of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Paul here seems to be making some sort of equation between the silent witness of the heavens and the preaching of Christ. Christ is proclaimed wordlessly by the very stars and planets. The heavens are telling the glory of God. No wonder, therefore, that the wise men found Christ in the stable at Bethlehem by the leading of a star. There was no speech, nor were there words. Their voice wasn't heard, yet their voice was heard deep in the soul. C.S. Lewis described Psalm 19 as the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the finest lyrics in the world. And he was very interested in this silent witness of the heavens. For Lewis, there were two kinds of silence, the good kind and the bad kind. The bad kind of silence features in the title of the first volume in his Ransom Trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet. The silent planet is Earth or thulkandra, as Lewis calls it. Earth is thulk, silent, because she doesn't, she doesn't join in with the music of the spheres. I hope you paid attention to Gustav Holst's portrayal of Mercury as you came in. The music of the spheres. Earth's presiding intelligence, Satan, the prince of this world, has nothing to say or to sing to the other planetary angels who are singing this perpetual gloria, telling the glory of God. Earth's silence, therefore, is a dumb silence. It is a mute silence. It, it is dead. It is sullen. Now, as far as the inhabitants of Earth are concerned, all the other planets are silent too, but for a very different reason. It's not because these other, other planets are sullenly incommunicado that they're not heard. On the contrary, they're not heard because their singing is perpetual. If you've read this novel, you will remember how Ransom, when he looks out of the window of his spaceship, marvels at the beauty of space, but then remarks to himself how space was the wrong word. It's not a vacancy up there. It's not merely an empty, hollow vacuity. No, space abhors a vacuum. And Ransom says to himself that older thinkers had been nearer the truth when they called space, not space, but the heavens. The heavens that tell the glory of God. It's a point Lewis returns to in an address entitled Imagination and Thought in the Middle Ages, where he says this. The music of the spheres is the only sound which has never for one split second ceased in any part of the universe. With this positive, we have no negative to contrast. Presumably, if it ever did stop, then with terror and dismay, with a dislocation of our whole auditory life, we should feel that the bottom had dropped out of our lives. But it never does. 
the music which is too familiar to be heard enfolds us day and night and in all ages. So in the old model of the cosmos, the pre-Copernican model, the planets were silent and sounding at the same time. Their music was not heard on Earth because it was always heard. Lewis likens the situation to the experience of those who are born near the great cataract on the river Nile. These people are born hearing the sound of the waterfall. It's filled their ears every moment of their lives since they first drew breath. And it's only when these people move 10, 15 miles away so that they can no longer hear the waterfall that for the first time in their lives they hear the waterfall. Because it stopped. They suddenly realise what they've been hearing all this time without knowing it. They now have a negative with which to contrast their positive experience of this sound. I'm sure you've had the same experience when you've visited someone who lives near a, an airport or a busy road. You, s you can't sleep in their house because of the noise and you get up in the morning bleary-eyed, you say to your host, how can you possibly ever get any sleep with that din going on? And they say, what din? They've stopped hearing it. They've got used to it. They don't notice it anymore. Familiarity breeds contempt. Now, interestingly, we are in this situation in a certain sense with regard to God. Lewis was interested in this verse from Colossians. For all things were created through Christ and for Christ, and in Christ all things hold together. Lewis paraphrased this verse. In one of his books, he paraphrased it as, Christ is the all-pervasive principle of cohesion whereby the universe holds together. Christ is the all-pervasive principle of cohesion whereby the universe holds together. But if this is true, if he is indeed all-pervasive, then we have no negative with which to contrast our positive experience of this Christ-drenched universe. And that puts us into something of a predicament, which Lewis writes about in Miracles. He says the fact, which is in one respect the most obvious and primary fact, namely God, Christ, and through which alone you have access to all the other facts, may be precisely the one that is most easily forgotten. Forgotten not because it's so remote or abstruse, but because it's so near and so obvious. And that is exactly how the supernatural has been forgotten. Because God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. We know God before we know anything else. But because God in this sense is ubiquitous, omnipresent, all things are being held together in him, he might as well in a, in a sense be nowhere because we have no negative with which to contrast this positive experience. If you want to hide something, put it in the open. Put it somewhere where people will walk past it every day of their lives, they'll never give it a second glance because familiarity breeds contempt. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, but we can't get absent from God in this sense. There is no Christ-less universe into which we can step and from which we can look back and survey this universe in which all things are held together in Christ, the divine word. Now, Lewis once said that the Narnia books were all about Christ. The Narnia books are all about Christ. And it's very obvious that in the character of Aslan, Lewis conveys a great deal about Christ. He dies for Edmund, he redeems Eustace, he creates Narnia, he judges Narnia, yes. But all these are discrete and particular actions. What about the cosmic Christ? What about this omnipresent, ubiquitous Christ who is in all things, in whom all things hold together? The whole Narnia series is about Christ. Well, where is this side of Christ's nature? It is an important aspect of biblical Christology and how does Lewis represent it in the Chronicles, if he does? 
In particular, how does he represent it in The Horse and His Boy, which is our special focus tonight. In The Horse and His Boy, we can point to discrete actions that Aslan takes during the course of the story, and even during the course of the back story, which we get to hear about near the end of the tale. But what about the cosmic logos? This divine word who has created all things, in whom all things hold together, constantly sounding, perpetually ringing in every atom of the universe. Where's that aspect of Christ in the horse and his boy? Well, this is where we need to return to the planets and the way in which the planets tell forth the glory of God. Indeed, speak the very word of Christ, to quote St. Paul even though they say no actual words. Lewis designed the Narnia books, I believe, out of the imagery of the seven heavens, the seven planets of the medieval cosmos. Let us remind ourselves what those seven planets were. Here is Earth, static and central, according to the old pre-Copernican model of the cosmos. And around Earth are the seven heavens, Seven spheres, crystalline spheres, each with its own planet and each planet with its own influences and attributes. The first of them being the Moon, <coughs> then Mercury, Venus. In the brightest heaven of invention, as Shakespeare puts it, we have the Sun. The Sun, remember, is a planet at this stage in astronomical history. Above the Sun, we have Mars, then Jupiter, and finally in the seventh heaven, Saturn. These are the seven heavens. And still today, occasionally, you hear someone say, uh, I was in the seventh heaven of delight. It's delightful to be in the seventh heaven because up there, you're furthest away from Earth and all its trials and tribulations. Keep going further and you will eventually escape the created order altogether and uh, emerge into the very home of God. Lewis was interested in this scheme and how it could be used poetically, imaginatively, Christianly. The greatest medieval poet to infuse this model of the cosmos with high religious ardor, Lewis says, is of course Dante in the Divine Comedy. In the Paradiso, the pilgrim mounts up through these seven heavens in his ascent to God's throne. Here's an illustration from the Divine Comedy showing you the planetary characters in the order of the days of the week. So here we have the sun for Sunday in his burning fiery chariot. Here is the moon in her silvery gown holding her crescent, the moon for Monday. Tuesday brings us to Tu or Tyr in Norse mythology or Mars in Roman, Martes in Spanish with his helmet and his chain mail. Here's Mercury, Miercoles, Wodin in Norse mythology with wings on his heels, Mercury the messenger, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn for Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Now Lewis thought that these pagan gods and goddesses could be used in a Christian way. He said, the characters of the planets as conceived by medieval astrology seem to me to have a permanent value as spiritual symbols, which is especially worthwhile in our own generation. We needn't be alarmed by his use of the word astrology here. It just means studying the stars. There's nothing necessarily wrong, foolish, occultic, about studying an aspect of God's creation. Indeed, it may lead us to worship Christ if we are wise astrologers, like the wise men in Matthew's Gospel. And he, Lewis is making here no small claim about the seven heavens. They are spiritual symbols of permanent value. It's not just for the medievals, no, they have a continuing value even in our own generation. But how could these pagan gods and goddesses be used Christianly? This is where we touch upon transferred classicism. This is a term Lewis used when talking about the technique that Christian poets used up until as late really as the 17th century, when they would take their knowledge of classical pagan deities and they would transfer it into their presentation of Christian themes. Paganism is the religion of poetry. 
in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance, Lewis says, through which the author can express at any moment just so much or so little of his real religion, his Christian religion, as his art requires. And everyone is in the secret. The Christian God often appears incognito, behind a mask in medieval and Renaissance literature. What Lewis is espousing here is a technique really that has a biblical source in, again, St. Paul, preaching to the men of Athens, you remember, in Acts 17, who says, God is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. And who is Paul quoting here? He's quoting Aratus and Epimenides, two Greek poets who wrote about Zeus. The original said, in Zeus we live and move and have our being, for we are indeed Zeus's offspring. Paul takes this pagan knowledge of deity and he transfers it into his presentation of the gospel. He says to the Athenians, you're right, we live and move and have our being in God. You're right, we are God's offspring. You're wrong in calling him Zeus. He is, in fact, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is transferred classicism, and it has a long and honourable history in Christian literature, which again Lewis writes about in his review of the Oxford Book of Christian Verse. He says this, just as in reading Johnson's London, you enjoyed the skill with which modern parallels were found for detail after detail in the juvenile, so in the Davides, the Christiad, or the Paradise Lost, you enjoyed seeing how well Christianity could produce the councils, catalogues, mercuries, and battle pieces of ancient epic. Okay, let's just pause for a moment and review where we've got to before we go any further. We are moving towards the horse and his boy, I assure you. We've seen how the stars and planets are silent witnesses. We've seen that Lewis is interested in the seven heavens of the medieval cosmos. We've seen that he attributes spiritual and imaginative value to pagan notions of God. Well, before we begin to analyse the horse and his boy, we just need to put one last stone in place, and that has to do with literature, and, and in particular, what Lewis calls the kappa element in romance. This is the title of a paper Lewis wrote, and kappa here is the initial letter of the Greek word krypton meaning cryptic or hidden. So the title of Lewis's essay basically means the hidden element in story. That's what romance means here, the hidden element in story. Now by the hidden element in story, Lewis meant the pervasive flavour or tone or atmosphere of a, of a story, a well-told tale. It's not just the plot that we like in a story, if it was only the plot that we liked in a story, we would never read the same story more than once. But you go back and back to your favourite stories many times in the course of your life because you like living in that world. You don't need to be reminded what happens, but you just like how it happens and why it happens. The whole world in which those happenings happen. To be stories at all, stories must be series of events. But it must be understood that this series, the plot as we call it, is only really a net whereby to catch something else. The real theme may be, and perhaps usually is, something that has no sequence in it. Something other than a process, and much more like a state or a quality. Okay, all our building blocks are now in place. Now we can turn to the horse and his boy and begin to see how Lewis so brilliantly structured this story, I believe, out of the imagery associated with Mercury. Think biblically about everything. Mercury, where is Mercury mentioned in the Bible? This is a real question. Anybody know? Without Googling it? <laughs> tush, tush, tush. Acts 14. Barnabas they called Jupiter, and Paul they called Mercury, because he was the chief speaker. Lewis had been fascinated by Mercury for much of his life, and it appears all over his works. 
for instance, in the discarded image, Lewis lists the various qualities associated with Mercury. And they include, of course, yes, chiefly speech. Mercury is the messenger. But also, more generally, learning and education. Oddly, theft and boxing. The metal Mercury, of course, Quicksilver. And even commerce, trade. Think of the word commerce, the merc suffix is related to Mercury etymologically. Lewis then admits it is difficult to see the unity of all Mercury's characteristics. Skilled eagerness or bright alacrity is the best I can do. But it is better just to take some real Mercury in a saucer and play with it for a few minutes. That is what Mercury means. It's actually rather dangerous to play with Mercury. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'm sure you've seen it rolling around a dish and splitting and dividing and coming together in glittering drops. It's a, it's a remarkable sight to behold. No, nothing else in this world moves quite like Mercury. And if we want to sort of sum up the mercurial spirit, really we should think of this before anything else. So that's Lewis in the discarded image in that hideous strength. He has a long passage about Mercury's influence coming down and taking hold of various characters in the story, a marvelously rich passage, which alas, we don't have time to go into tonight. So let us move on swiftly to his poetry, a long poem called The Planets that Lewis wrote in the 1930s, <coughs> has this passage about Mercury. Mercury marches, mad cap rover, patron of pulphras, pert quicksilver his gaze begets, goblin mineral, merry multitude of meeting selves, same but sundered. From the soul's darkness with wreathed wand, words he marshals, guides and gathers them, gay bellwether of flocking fancies. His flint has struck the spark of speech from spirit's tinder, lord of language. He leads forever the spangle and splendor, sport that mingles sound with senses in subtle pattern words in wedlock, and wedding also of thing with thought. That's just a very brief summary of some of Lewis's thoughts about the symbolic qualities of Mercury, summed up in this image. And the place to start in analyzing the mercurial imagery of the horse and his boy is with this very notion of quicksilver rolling around a dish dividing and coming back together again. Shasta is united with Brie. Aravis is united with Huin. These pairs are then driven close to each other by roaring lions, one on the left, one on the right, they think. At one point, Brie veers off to the right, just as Huin veers off to the left, but then they're forced back together, neck to neck, knee to knee, side by side. They come to the city of Tashban, you remember, where they separate. But they're all reunited on the other side of the city, and they journey across the desert. At the hermit's house, Shasta runs on ahead alone, but returns there later. And the whole destination of the journey is what? It's not just Narnia. It's Narnia and Archenland both. And we read of plenty of comings and goings between Narnia and Archenland. All this separating and uniting imagery is comically brought to a head in the relationship of Shasta and Aravis, who become so used to quarrelling and making it up again that they got married so as to go on doing it more conveniently. <laughs> the most significant of all these reunions in the story is, of course, that of the twins, the protagonists at the heart of the tale, Shasta and Corin. Remember what the planet's poem said, Mercury brings about meeting selves, same but sundered. Now these twins are not only twin brothers, they are identical twins, separated shortly after birth, and their coming back together is the main event of the plot. They are as like as two peas, almost exactly alike. They are doubles of each other. And there are other pairs of brothers in the story too, Dar and Darren, Cole and Colin, it's pretty, too, it's pretty clear that they too are twins. 
And the reason for thinking this is that the main pair of brothers, Cor and Corin, aren't just any old twins, but they are reflections of the twins, Gemini. <coughs> this constellation is relevant because in astrology, Gemini is a house, is a constellation ruled by Mercury. We know Lewis to have been deeply interested in astrology and especially in the literary use that could be made of it. Here's a page of notes that I found in Lewis's handwriting from his complete Chaucer. He's making notes here about Chaucer's Knight's Tale. Lewis says that Chaucer in the Knight's Tale uses the planetary characters very cleverly. He doesn't just put them as actors into the drama, but he weaves the influences into the plot so that the climax of the Knight's Tale happens on a Tuesday. Martes. How appropriate for a story about martial knights. But back to Mercury and Gemini. Gemini consists of the stellated brothers Castor and Pollux, and they are the models for Shasta and Corin. Now here's another little biblical test for you. Think biblically about everything. Where are Castor and Pollux mentioned in the Bible? No Googling. Again, the book of Acts. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island of Malta. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. Now, Homer in the Iliad described Castor as a great breaker of horses and Pollux as a renowned boxer. Think of Shasta and Corin. Shasta doesn't break Bree in the literal sense of taming him, but he does break Bree's pride and self-conceit. At least Shasta ran back, Bree says, and that's what shames me most of all. I, who called myself a war horse and boasted of a hundred fights to be beaten by a little human boy, a child, a mere foal, when they're being chased by <coughs> the lion, Bree scarpers for his life. It's the little boy who goes back and stands up to the ferocious beast. So Bree is broken by Shasta, the great breaker of horses. And it seems likely that Lewis chose the name Shasta, Cor, as a piece of his own wordplay. Cor, Shasta, gives us Castor. And just as Shasta is based on Castor, so Corin is based on Pollux. For Corin, you remember, is a great fighter. He's constantly flooring people. No one could ever equal Corin as a boxer. And after he has boxed the lapsed bear of Stormness without a timekeeper for 33 rounds, he gains the name Corin Thunderfist. According to Greek mythology, Hermes, the Greek equivalent of Mercury, invented boxing. And the unfortunate Shasta, we're told, is used to hard knocks. And that's just as well, because all his fights with his brother ended if they didn't begin with Cor being knocked down. Think of boxers coming up against each other in the ring and separating again, constantly going head to head and then falling apart. Think of that also in connection with roads. <coughs> roads bifurcate, they divide, they come back together again, they form crossroads. Mercury was the god of crossroads and in ancient Greece, columnar pedestals carrying busts of Hermes were set up as boundary markers at signposts and important junctions. Here is Hercules standing next to one of those pedestals. This helps explain a nice little detail in the horse and his boy. Inside the Tashban city, everyone seemed to be going either to the left or the right. Aravis and Lazaraline have to go either left or right. Shasta in the mountain pass finds that the road divided into two and realises that if I stay at the crossroads, I'm sure to be caught. The story could be utterly the same without that little detail. Why has Lewis put it in there? It's part of his <coughs> overall intention to evoke the spirit of Mercury. To hesitate is to be lost in this story, for speed is of the essence of Mercury. There's a great sense of urgency throughout the tale, you remember, with repeated cries of Narnia in the north. Bree gallops for sheer joy, then for sheer terror. Aslan chases them to the hermit's dwelling. 
causing Bree to discover that he's not really been going as fast, not quite as fast as he really could. Shasta is told to run now, without a moment's rest. Run, run, always run. When chapter nine ends with the word slowly, we feel there's something going dangerously wrong. Now, of course, Mercury was swift of foot, not for the sake of swiftness alone, but because he was the messenger of the gods. Here's a statue of Mercury from one of the Oxford colleges. Lewis would have walked past this statue many a time. With that in mind, turn to this image from the horse and his boy. Shasta, the fleet-footed messenger to the king of Archenland. So reminiscent of that traditional picture of Mercury with the wings on his heels and the wings on his cap. We see them here in this image, the wings on the cap. Interestingly, a Narnian lord, we're told, wears a steel or silver cap with little wings on either side of it. Here's an illustration by Pauline Baines from the first edition of The Horse and His Boy. You don't see it in modern editions, but it was opposite the frontispiece in the first edition. And I think Pauline Baines has picked up on that little detail in the text, in the way she's depicted that main figure. With, you see the little pointy wing-like things on his crown and, and even rather similar sort of wing-like shapes on his heels there. I suspect that's what she's getting at. Why would Lewis put the petasus, as it's called, the mercurial hat, into this story? It's just another little detail, a way of communicating, embodying, expressing wordlessly the mercurial essence. Shasta, we're told, is going to be educated. How appropriate, because Mercury inspires the studious and the clerkly. Shasta, we're told, had read no books at all, but he discovers that education and all sorts of horrible things are going to happen to him. I think it's rather nice that the learned Lewis here pokes fun at the prospect of being educated. It's a nice example of the playful mercurial temperament. One Lewis scholar called Martha Sammons has suggested that Shasta's name is based on an Indian word, Shastri, one who is learned, who teaches. That may be correct. There's no particular evidence in Lewis's writings that he knew that language, but he could well have done. It seems too neat to be a mere coincidence. And I'm very prepared to steal the idea of Martha Sammons, Mercury is the patron of pilferers after all. <laughs> Talking of messengers and education brings us to speech. A central theme of the horse and his boy is language, that faculty of which Mercury is lord. On the very first page of the book, you remember, we learn that the Calamines liked talking to one another slowly about things that sounded dull. We're told of the loquacity the idle words of the Calamines. We hear their vain repetitions about the Tisrock, may he live forever. We're informed by Bree that this is all slaves talk, it's fools talk, it is southern jargon. And we're given several examples of their long-winded, boring, vapid proverbial utterances. Let me give you two. For as a costly jewel retains its value even if hidden in a dunghill, so old age and discretion are to be respected even in the vile persons of our subjects. For nothing is more suitable to persons of gravity and decorum than to endure minor inconveniences with constancy. In contrast, Narnian proverbs are very brief, they're pithy, they're witty, easily in but not easily out, as the lobster said in the lobster pot. Maybe apes will grow honest. Come live with me and you'll know me. Eggs, no, nests before eggs. Calamine poetry is also contrasted with Narnian poetry. One of the Calamines says that Narnian poetry is not like ours, full of choice epithems and useful maxims, but is full of love and war. He observes how well it was said by a gifted Calamine poet that deep draughts from the fountain of reason are desirable to extinguish the fire of youthful love. All this 
presentation of boring language, dull language, is necessary so that as the story moves to the poetic north, we will feel the growing strength of the mercurial influence. There's a grand feast near the end of the tale, and Shasta and Aravis are prepared to be bored when the bard with his fiddlers steps forward to sing his lay. For the only poetry they knew was the calamine kind, and you know now what that was like. But at the very first scrape of the fiddles, a rocket seemed to go up inside their heads. They realise what poetry is for. And this theme of language works itself out with respect to the two horses as well, both of whom have had to pretend while living in Calamine not to be talking animals. Shasta says right at the start of the book, I wish you could talk, old fellow, to Bree, and Bree reveals that he can indeed speak, but that ever since he was taken captive, he's been pretending to be dumb and witless. Rabidash, you remember, the foolish Rabidash. He's turned into a donkey. And the centrality of language in Lewis's understanding of human nature is indicated during the trans transformation scene. We're told Rabidash's human speech lasted just a moment longer than his human shape. The Calamines are typically unmercurial, but Lewis is prepared to find an exception even to the prevailing Calamine abuses of language. Aravis, depicted here, her storytelling style is called the Grand Calamine Manor. It is praised by the author who says, for in Calamine, storytelling is a thing you're taught, just as English boys and girls are taught essay writing. The difference is that people want to hear the stories, whereas I never heard of anyone who wanted to read the essays. We need also to observe how Mercury's metal makes its way into the story. Mercury, remember, is a kind of silver, quick silver. It's listed in the periodic table as HG, that is Hydra Argyrum, water plus silver. It's a double metal. It's both liquid and solid at the same time. Remember that moment in The Horse and His Boy, in the chapter entitled Across the Desert. We read this, under the moonlight, the sand in every direction, and as far as they could see, gleamed as if it were smooth water or a great silver tray. Now, of course, Lewis can't tilt this silver tray of water as he suggests tilting a saucer of quicksilver. <coughs> However, he does show us the effects upon it of a swift sunrise when the sand is lit up in an instant, strewn with diamonds. That is what mercurial means. Now, when we turn to the more explicitly theological messages conveyed under the auspices of Mercury, the most obvious thing to consider is the depiction of Aslan, the discreet Aslan, the, the incarnate Aslan. All the things we've already been discussing are, as it were, the discarnate Aslan. The word of Aslan evidencing itself in all the things that he has made. The crossroads, the boxes, the names, the, the language. What about when Mercury's spirit is compressed and consolidated in the discreet person of Aslan? His encounter with Shasta in the mountain pass is one of the high points in the Chronicles, I think. And when Shasta meets this unwelcome fellow traveler, he says, don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions? Aslan replies, there was only one lion. Shasta's confused, what on earth do you mean? I've just told you there were at least two the first night and he's interrupted. There was only one, but he was swift of foot. How do you know? asks Shasta. I was the lion. And as Shasta gaped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued, I was the lion who forced you to join with Aravis. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you should reach King Loon in time. 
And I was the lion you do not remember, who pushed the boat in which you lay a child near death, so that it came to shore where a man sat wakeful at midnight to receive you. As the incarnation of the spirit of Mercury, Aslan is swift of foot, wings on his heels, so to speak. He's the living and active word. He's the living and active principle of dividing and recombining. Shasta has so far understood Aslan only in multiple cats and lions. Here in this particular exchange, Aslan reveals that all those many lions were but components of a single lion. That repeated phrase, I was the lion, I was the lion, it's a stylistic embodiment of the very thing that is being communicated. But then, to show that Mercury does not only combine multiplicity in singularity, but also singularity in multiplicity, Lewis presents us with the most obviously Trinitarian moment in the whole of the Narnia series. Who are you? asked Shasta. Myself, said the voice, very deep and low, so that the earth shook. And again, myself, loud and clear and gay. And then the third time, myself, whispered so softly you could hardly hear it. And yet it seemed to come from all around you as if the leaves rustled with it. So in this passage, Lewis very neatly deploys his mercurial imagery to present the Holy Trinity, one God in three persons, one lion in a threefold myself. It is a Christianized version of Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes, as he was known in classical times. It's the obvious theological message to communicate via Mercury. But because the theological message is so familiar to us, it would be very easy to conclude that it was Lewis's starting point. As if he sat down one day and said to himself, what major Christian doctrines haven't I dealt with yet? I've had the gospel in the lion, I've had creation in the magician's nephew, I've had the apocalypse in the... You know, that's not how he did it, I'm sure. I would argue that the images associated with Mercury were Lewis's imaginative starting point he then worked his mind into those images. He'd been familiar with it for decades. And as his imagination moved about in that image world, he came to realize that the symbols of Mercury naturally disposed themselves in a Trinitarian fashion. Lewis once said that imaginative composition was a process of recombining elements made by God and already containing his meanings. You don't just make things up as a poet. You find the meaning in the things that God has made. The task of the poet is to discover those meanings. And finding the Holy Trinity in Mercury, in Quicksilver, is one of the clearest examples, I think, of Lewis's theological imagination at work. So the horse and his boy is irradiated with mercurial influences. It's natural for Lewis to find in Mercury Christ as the Word of God. And it's very interesting to note that the lion isn't named Aslan during that encounter with Shasta in the mountain pass. He's described first as the thing or person, then as the large voice, and finally just as the voice, capital V. Shasta, in contrast, has virtually no voice. Who are you? He said, scarcely above a whisper. And Aslan's reply, his first recorded utterance in this story is very significant. So this is the very first thing Aslan says in the story. Who are you? One who has waited long for you to speak. Aslan is Lord of language. He has come both to speak and to be spoken to. The British theologian Alistair McGrath says, one of the many merits of the writings of Lewis 
is that they take seriously the way in which words can generate and transform experience. That's a very important observation, I think, and very relevant to that passage in The Horse and His Boy. But we must be clear what kind of experience is being generated. It's not principally, actually, an experience containable by more mere words. Shasta doesn't suddenly start talking. On the contrary, we're told, he gaped with open mouth and said nothing. Then, after one glance at the lion's face, he slipped out of the saddle and fell at its feet. He couldn't say anything, but then he didn't want to say anything, and he knew he needn't say anything. A similar silence falls on Aravis and the horses when they meet Aslan in chapter 14. Strange to say, we're told, they felt no inclination to talk to one another about him after he had gone. They all moved slowly away to different parts of the quiet grass and there paced to and fro, each alone, thinking. The protagonists are silent when they meet the word made flesh. But their silence is not simply an absence of words. It is rather an eloquent silence, an articulacy of a spiritual kind. Not wordlessness, but rather wordfulness, so full of words that only actions make sense. The divine word descends upon the children and the horses, or rather it elevates them into itself, and they're not rendered dumb and witless by the meeting. Rather, they find themselves speaking at the highest pitch of articulacy through an irradiation of their whole selves with significance and relation by means of physical acts such as Shasta's prostration, a response which is not merely verbal but actual. After all, what are words? without the divine mercury, only so much hot air, like the long-winded jargon of the Calamines, like the many words of the Gentiles. We are not heard in our prayers for our many words. So I believe that mercury is the silent witness sounding throughout the horse and his boy, even in the most obscure parts which we have no time to touch upon, like the use of the word timey, the name Ram for Shastra and Aravis' son, the description of the smell of the fish in the air, that's all mercurial. You can trace it in Lewis's imagination. This story, which might appear at superficial glance to have little rhyme or reason behind it, biblically speaking, is actually itself irradiated with significance and scriptural truth down to the level of the most minutely sophisticated patterning. Lewis believed that the real universe, though it may often look chaotic and undesigned, is drenched, is drenched with divine purpose. Even down to the choice of an unnamed character's headgear with little wings on either side of it. Thank you very much. Or have I reduced you to wordlessness? <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, are the other books connected to the planets as well? Yes. They are these. The Horse and His Boy is Mercury. The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is Jupiter. Prince Caspian is Mars. The Dawn Treader is the Sun. The Silver Chair is the Moon. The magician's nephew is Venus, and the, and the last battle is Saturn. That's what my book Planet Narnia is all about. And they're all equally detailed. 
When I stumbled across this, when I was halfway through my PhD, I felt almost literally concussed. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> How could I have missed this? How could anybody have missed this? It's so obvious once you see it. But Lewis deliberately kept it silent because he wanted to communicate to our imaginations. He wanted to make us feel these spiritual symbols rather than to identify them with our intellects. Now, some people say to me, haven't I therefore just ruined his whole plan <laughs> <laughs> in getting you all to identify with your intellects? But I think what I'm doing is, is a very proper, legitimate task of literary criticism. Lewis himself was a literary critic and explored other writers like Dante and Spencer and Milton in just the same way that I've been unpicking Lewis himself tonight. You know, he would show how the literary text was put together, what the words referred to, what the allusions were, what the generic conventions were, and so on. That's a proper task for literary critics. It's not the task that you expect of an author. The author gives you the story, and the story should speak for itself. The author doesn't need to admit you to all his workings, to show you backstage, as it were. <coughs> Lewis had to keep it quiet. But I think it's quite proper for us to investigate it in a sort of literary critical setting like tonight, with this one proviso that we don't think that these, you know, this dismantled vehicle that we've laid out on the garage floor is now the true car. Obviously, we've dismantled it so that we can put it back together again and it will run all the more smoothly and we'll be able to understand it all the more intelligently the next time we go for a drive. So the next time you read The Horse and His Boy, hopefully you will forget, in one sense, all that you have heard tonight and just throw yourself into the story, but equipped, uh, enabled with some other part of your mind, so to speak, to, to appreciate better what's going on in the tale, to realise how minutely sophisticated is the patterning and what the theological significance of that is. Yes. Um, since you bring up your book, uh, Queen of Narnia, in more detail, I have a question related to that. Um, you talked a bit about uh, your view, you expressed in the book, that Lewis is a secretive man, um, and that he planned this in order for us to better understand it through that experiential element. Um, and I was just curious if you could share a bit more, um, maybe about what your views are about um, reading literature in relation to a person's life and biography, just because you seem to base your thesis of Narnia partially on who Lewis was as a man and what his intentions were um, with the text. And mm. I was just curious about that because um, I read uh, his uh, conversation with Tilliard in A Personal Heresy and yes. he gave him his own views on the person of the author. And so I was curious what yours were. Yes. Thank you. Very good question. Yes, in this Personal Heresy book that Lewis wrote with another critic called Tilliard, uh, they went hammer and tongs about the, the proper place of, of biographical criticism in understanding literature. And uh, Lewis was very against it, yeah. Um, but I think he was against it for this reason, that you don't, you don't use the literary text in order to explain things about the author's life and, and experience. That's a, misre that's a misuse of, of, of imaginative literature. But that's not actually what I'm trying to do in Planet Narnia. I'm, you know, I'm doing straight biography. I'm looking at his life. You know, we have many examples of Lewis's capacity for secretiveness. You know, he didn't tell people he was getting married, for instance. <laughs> he kept his marriage secret for the best part of a year. He... Uh, you know, he used many different pen names in the course of his career. He lent a book of his early verse to a friend without telling the friend that he was the author under this pseudonym. <laughs> you know, he left out so many things in Surprised by Joy, his spiritual memoir, that one of his friends jokingly said it should not have been called Surprised by Joy. It should have been called Suppressed by Jack. <laughs> So all those biographical details, 
I, I'm not getting those through the Narnia Chronicles. I'm getting those through straight biography, straight history, looking at his diaries and uh, you know, other materials. But then, when you turn back to the Narnia Chronicles and this huge secret, which is there at the heart of them, those biographical data actually help account, help explain how, why he could keep this massive secret secret. You know, if you can keep a marriage secret, you can keep anything secret. <laughs> so those people who say to me, I just can't believe the, the planetary reading of Narnia because Lewis couldn't have kept that sort of thing secret. Well, I say, look at his life. In this sense, his life is relevant to a reading of the text. But I'm not getting at his life through the text. That's the key distinction, I think. Any other questions? Matt? Uh, I, if, if this is a foggy memory, but if I'm right, some people have brought this book in for criticism, thinking that it's got some kind of latent racist overtone. Is, is that right? First of all? Oh, yeah, of course. Mm. So, <laughs> <laughs> could, you, could you speak to, to that, uh, not so much the criticism, but that aspect of the book uh, in light of the mercurial influence? Is there, is there anything to be found out there? Well, um, I mean, I, I'm of the opinion that pretty much everything in, in the Narnia books can be explained by reference to the, the prevailing planetary spirit. I mean, I, I, b I believe that in principle, but that's different from saying I can therefore explain every part of it. Uh, you know, there are things which do mystify me, yes, and I, I expect Lewis could explain it very well. Um, I mean, obviously, not absolutely everything. There must always be a little bit of padding, a little bit of make-weight in any story, you, you can't get everything 100% perfect. Um, but to answer your question, I think, I mean, Lewis hated the Arabian Nights. He says that was one of his least favorite books as a child. And so I wonder whether he isn't sort of exorcising one of his, <laughs> his early prejudices in, in making, you know, the, this very oriental culture of the Calomines. Uh, a very lugubrious and unimaginative culture. Um, it's a literary orientalism, I think. It, it, we're, not, we're not meant to pay particular attention to the pigmentation of these characters' faces. Um, it's not because they're dark or black that they are bad. Um, and indeed, Aravis is a Calamine princess, and she ends up marrying Shasta. You know, it's a very forward-thinking example of you know, mixed race marriage from the supposedly racist Lewis. Um, you know, I, I don't think, there's no, exa no, there's no evidence in Lewis's own life that he, that he was, you know, he had any racial overtones or undertones. He was, you know, he was a very, very um, tolerant person. But also it's worth pointing out that, you know, Lewis wrote, lived and wrote most of his life before in, in the British context, before the huge influx of immigration that occurred in the 1950s. You know, for until about 1950, 1955, British society was very, very monochrome. Um, it has become multiracial in the last four or five decades, but Lewis didn't live to see that. So that's, you know, that's a historical datum worth bearing in mind, that, that Lewis lived in a different culture, actually. You know, attitudes to race in his day were so different. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I think I mean, if Lewis was writing today, he wouldn't write quite the same about the Calamines as he did back in the 19, early 1950s. Um, but those who say, oh, he's just racist, they, they overlook the fact that Aravis is a Calamine. They overlook this character, Emeth, in The Last Battle, who is noble and honorable. You know, it's the content of your character that matters in Narnia. It's not the color of your skin. Yes, sir. Um, so you've studied such an imaginative person for so long as Lewis. I'm curious what you'd say uh, is the role of imagination in the life of anyone in both learning about God and sharing God with other people? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I think for Lewis, imagination is, is really the sine qua non. Without imagination, you have nothing. You, you, have, you have no knowledge, you have no literature, you have no language. Imagination is the basis of, of all linguistic thought. 
I mean, as soon as you get beyond, you know, direct sensible experience, this, this tangible plat platform, this visible person and so on, as soon as you get beyond, as soon as you get into super sensibles, as Lewis calls them, you have to operate through metaphor. And metaphors are apprehended imaginatively. Um, so, having a healthy imagination is, for Lewis, a particularly important thing. Um, by, by healthy, he means knowing the hidden metaphors in your language. Um, you know, like I mentioned commerce tonight, that, that merce, the, in, the connection there to Mercury is etymologically interesting. Um, we shouldn't just think that it means trade. No, there's, there's a richer meaning behind that word. You want to keep your imagination healthy? Study etymology. Um, secondly, another way of keeping your imagination healthy is to have a great deal of um, alternative metaphors for expressing a given thing, so that you don't become a victim of metaphor. Because you know, any given metaphor has certain boundaries, certain constraints, certain deficiencies. So you need a great variety of different metaphors, different, different tools in your toolbox, different golf clubs in your, club, in, in your golf bag um, for the different things that you're trying to say and know. And I think that's one of the reasons, actually, why Lewis so admires the, the seven heavens as spiritual symbols, that you have seven ways of talking about the spiritual life. You can talk about God as king under Jupiter. You can talk about God as commander under Mars, you can talk about God as light under the sun, you can talk about God as word under Mercury, you can talk about God as life under the rubric of Venus, you know, all these different ways, each correcting and relieving the other. And that's part of the richness too of the biblical witness, that we don't just think of God as God, you know, we think of God as shepherd, as bridegroom, as judge, as priest, as victim as vine, as door, you know, as water, as bread. All these rich, redolent metaphors to get in something of the, of the inexhaustible richness of God. And a healthy imagination will always be expanding the territory, finding new ways of thinking and writing about God and about, you know, our relationship with him, our relationship in the spiritual life with one another. And I think that's one of the, the great merits of Lewis as a writer and also, you know, other writers like Tolkien, that they, they're constantly you know, pushing out the boundaries into new, into new realms, uh, giving us new ways of, of thinking and knowing. It's a creative enterprise, really. L Tolkien calls it sub-creation. We ought to be creative in this sense because we have been made in the image of a creator god. And unless we're exercising our imaginations, we're actually not really flourishing as human individuals. We need to be creative in that sense. I mean, not necessarily writing stories, but you know, acting in plays, singing songs. You know, sport can be creative. Uh, that's a necessary part of our human nature. And it's all fundamentally imaginative in the sense that it's a way of acquiring or discerning meaning in the things that God has made. How long have we got, Matt? A, a few more minutes? Yes, ma'am. All right, so at the beginning of the lecture, you had talked about uh, Psalm 19, mm. where creation itself takes part in this proclaim, mm. this message. Mm. And if I recall correctly, as uh, the small group of Shasta, Gray, Quinn, and uh, Aravis, uh, yes. Uh, Mm. There's a lark singing. Mm. And it appears once more. And I was wondering if that would be an example of kind of creation taking on this Mercurian idea of mm. speech and if it occurs elsewhere in the in the book. Yes. Good question. Um Well, yes, it does. I mean in any number of ways. Um you know, babbling brooks and singing larks and, and sprinting deer, uh, you know, Chervy, the, the deer who runs off in great haste to, to warn of the coming invasion. You know, those are all ways in which 
non the Narnian natural world is, is braced and ready to, to uh, you know, be ignited by a mercurial spark of spirit's tinder. Um, I mentioned in my final paragraph something about fish. Uh, let me just quickly explain that, because that, that's a particularly delightful one to me. <laughs> um, I was looking in Lewis's complete Chaucer, and in one of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, there's a reference to Mercury, and how Mercury is desolate in Pisces. You know, astrologically, a planet had great power in one zodiacal house and least power in another. And Mercury's power was, was least strong in the house of Pisces. Mercury is desolate in Pisces. And Lewis has marked this in his complete chores. He's underlined it or he made a marginal comment against it. Now you remember in The Horse and His Boy, Shasta is raised by a cruel fisherman. And the smell of the fish is in his ears and his no nose, the whole nostrils. You don't get smell in your ears, do you? Um, <laughs> it's flooding his senses uh, the whole of his uh, young life. And then he escapes with Bree to going towards the north and he wakes up the following morning and there's something different. He, he sniffs the air and he realises he can no longer smell the fish in the air. He's no longer desolate in Pisces. I'm sure that's why Lewis put that there. So even the air of Narnia breathes out the mercurial influence. But I mean, Lewis uses air in that sense all over the place. You know, Uncle Andrew in The Magician's Nephew breathes in the young air of Narnia and becomes younger and stronger in a very Venus kind of way. Um, there's something in the air of Narnia that saves Susan's bowstring from perishing in, the, in Prince Caspian. You know, her, her weapon of war has been preserved by the martial influenza, influence in the air of Narnia in that book. So across the series, you have seven types of air that the characters are breathing in. And here in The Horse and His Boy, it's not fishy. <laughs> um, as you're being reduced to wordlessness, can I, can I say one last thing and then we'll stop? Because this is another thing that I only discovered after writing Planet Narnia. Um, and it ties in so well with the theme of tonight that I, I can't forbear to share it with you. Um, we have this sentence near the start of The Horse and His Boy when Bree is longing to get to Narnia and he's talking about the happy land of Narnia, Narnia of the heathery mountains and the thymy downs, the, 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 the plashing glens and the, and the, uh, and the other things. Uh, but the, the, key, the key point here is the word thymy. Even when I was a boy reading The Horse and His Boy, I thought, that's an unusual word, timey, because it's got no vowels. I was fascinated by that word. You know, it pertains to the herb time. Um, when I came across this mercurial theme in The well, Horse and His Boy, <coughs> I had that niggling away at the back of my mind. I wonder if I can ever explain the word timey in connection with mercury. And imagine my joy when I discovered I could. <laughs> because someone lent me A.E. Houseman's book of poems, The Shropshire Lad. Now we know that Lewis read The Shropshire Lad many times. He says in one of his letters, I'm dipping into The Shropshire Lad for the hundredth time. Okay, so he knew this volume of verse very well indeed. In The Shropshire Lad, there's a poem entitled The Merry Guide. These are some of the lines from the poem. Once in the wind of morning, I ranged the thymy wold. There, through the dews beside me, behold a youth that trod with feathered cap on forehead and poised a golden rod. Oh, whence, I asked, and whither? He smiled and would not say, and looked at me and beckoned and laughed and led the way. And with kind looks and laughter and naught to say beside and smiles and nothing spoken, led on my merry guide, with lips that brim with laughter but never once respond, and feet that fly on feathers, and serpent-circled wand. This is a poem about Mercury, and it mentions the timey wald. <laughs> Lewis read this a hundred times, 
That's why the word timey appears in the horse and his boy. I thank you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.